everybody. Welcome to, for your middle schoolers, yours is first talk of the day. Um, we're going to get rolling here. We'll probably have a few stragglers come in and that's okay. I'm very, very excited to present uh, Amanda. Man, I'm going to say your last, last name wrong. Can you say it for me? Copus. There we go. I, knew I get it wrong every time. Um, right. I'm so gotten excited. Wrong for 20 years. <laughs> I've been so excited to have her here today. Amanda is actually a friend of mine. She is joining us from the Seattle area in Washington State. She is going to actually open us in prayer and introduce herself, but just a few things. She's been in youth ministry for over 15 years, and she's living out the vocation of marriage. She's been married to her husband for 20 years now. So she's going to dive into the topic today of what is your guys' vocation as a middle schooler? What are you called to starting tomorrow? What is my vocation? What can I do? Obviously, I can't get married yet. I can't be a sister or a priest yet. So what are you going to do in the meantime? And Amanda's going to dive into that with us. Couple housekeeping notes before we get started. The chat box is going to be getting turned off during the presentation. So you guys can be fully present and fully here for your presentation. If you have questions, we're going to have an open Q&A session at the end with Amanda. Um, you will be able to ask questions in the chat box and I will go ahead and ask those to her out loud at the end. So if you have questions throughout the talk that you're like, oh, I'd love to hear more about that, what it may be. She has a ministry she runs. She may talk about it today. She may not. You can ask her at the end what her ministry is if she does not. Um, throw it in the chat box. No one will see those questions except myself and then we'll filter them out. So Amanda, I'm going to hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rylan. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I was so excited when Rylan uh, contacted me and asked me to be um, a part of this with you guys today. Um, so before I dive in and introduce myself and everything, um, we're going to start this session just by reminding ourselves um, who we are and whose we are as we begin in prayer. So in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious and loving God, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come together here um, for the gift of technology that allows us to gather um, not just across the country, but across the world and be able to be present here together uh, with you, Lord. And we just ask your Holy Spirit to descend upon uh, myself and upon all those in attendance um, to bless this time that we have together, to um, inspire our hearts to hear the message that you have for each of us, to remember that there are no coincidences that you bring us to every moment in time intentionally, Lord. Um, and it's, it's all part of your call to, to love us and to call us closer to you. So in the next hour, we just pray that you're present um, here with us in our hearts and in our minds, um, and that we can hear your whisper, your, your, uh, your words of love echoing in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, uh, as Ms. Buchanan noted, noted I am um, Amanda Copas, and I am here coming to you from outside of Seattle, Washington. Um, and I spent 15 years as a youth minister at um, youth minister and volunteer at my local parish. And then I have since started a speaking uh, ministry called Ruah Ministries. Oops, this side, there we go. Um, <laughs> um, that allows me to get to connect with uh, young people like yourselves all over the country, apparently all over the world today, which is pretty exciting. Um, and so it's super fun to be here today and get to talk to you guys about something that um, that I've spent a lot of my adult life, especially um, kind of thinking about and praying through and, and living out. And that is really discerning what our vocation is, um, discerning what my vocation is at various stages of my life. And I wish that somebody at your age, some, when I was your age, that somebody had talked to me um, about what it means to have a vocation, what a vocation is, how we discern that um, and not just as like the big V vocation, right? Um, but also as like, what is God calling me to do now? How is he calling me to love and serve him now? So we're gonna kind of talk about both of those things and how the now helps to inform the later too. Um, so let's get going on that, huh? All right, so the first thing I talk about is like, what is a vocation? And I know this whole retreat on vocations, I know you guys have talked about this um, before. So this is just gonna be a quick little review so that we all have the same. Uh, vocabulary to use while we're going throughout um, the next the next hour together. So um, there are two types of vocation that or de definitions for vocation that you'll hear. Um, the first one is a secular de uh, description, which is just simply it's the work in which a person is employed. Um, 
So if your mom is a nurse, her voc or secular vocation is that of a nurse, right? Um, your dad's a businessman or a lawyer or those sorts of things. Like that is their secular vocation. That's the work in which they're employed. It's what they do every day in and out. But our religious vocation, um, the definition of a religious vocation is how God is calling us to serve him in the world. And traditionally, we kind of think of religious vocations as, um, as our big four, right? Um, so we've got the four what are called primary vocations in the church, which is marriage, priesthood, religious life, or singlehood. And now this is interesting. I love this because when I was growing up, there were only three. We only talked about three primary vocations, um, marriage, priesthood, and religious life. Um, but the, the church now fully recognizes a third or fourth, I'm sorry, I can count, really I can, it's fine, it's early here, um, a, a fourth primary vocation that they call singlehood or consecrated single, um, and that is recognizing that there's a section of people who are called to live out um, their lives as an unmarried, um, but also not as a priest or, uh, you know, a priest or a religious sister or brother, um, but they're called to stay single in service of the kingdom and service of the church. Um, and I've, I've known a couple of people who have discerned this vocation. And um, I know some people who have friends who are living this out. And it's a really unique and beautiful way because it, it allows you to dedicate your life to, um, to service of God and service of the church um, in whatever way you feel called. So if you're in a, uh, if you're a priest or you're in a religious order, um, you know, your um, obedience is to your, um, your superior. Um, as a single person, you're, you're more free to respond to um, God's calling your life, wherever that may be. So it's a really cool um, vocation. I'm really happy that the, uh, the church has now kind of fully recognized that, and it's becoming something that's talked about more and known more um, as another option for how God might be calling you to live in the world. Um, so some of you are probably going right now, yeah, it's a vocation to treat Amanda. We're, we're going to talk about this all day. Like, um, we've talked about it before, we know. Um, but those are things, you know, I'm, I'm a middle schooler. I can't be married. Like, I can't be a priest yet. I can't enter seminary. I can't go into formation for a religious order. Like, um, I am single, but that's, you know, because I'm a middle schooler. Um, so what... Do, do these vocations, which is vocation in general or, or discerning a vocation have to do with me um, in my stage of life right now? Um, and that's a great, it's a great question. It's, it's, it's one of those things, again, that I don't think we talk about enough because we talk so much about the primary vocations, which is great. We want to talk about the primary vocations. They're important. Discerning how God is calling you to live out your life uh, on a larger scale is a super, super important thing. Um, but it can be hard at the stage of life that you're in now to, frankly, to care sometimes, right? Because it feels like so distant, like marriage or priesthood or religious life or any of that. Like it feels like so far out in the future um, that it's hard to understand what a vocation, what discerning a vocation, how that could have any relevance. Um, to you now. Um, and so that's what we're going to talk about because it's true. We all have a primary vocation, right? We all have one of those four we were just talking about, right? That God is going to call us or is calling us to right now. And it's going to be the way that we live out our adult life. We live out our adult faith. We serve God in the world as an adult. Um, and God wants to reveal that vocation to us. Um, unfortunately, God's not on Twitter. You know, he doesn't have a cell phone where he can text us or give us a call um, and just say, hey, you know, Mary, this is what um, I want you to do. Here you go. Uh, you're going to be a sister and you're going to be a priest and you're going to, you guys, this whole group over here is going to be married. And, um, and there you go, done, right? And we can walk off and just feel like we know where we're going in life. And um, unfortunately, that is not the way that, um, that God works. He reveals things to us. He reveals things to us slowly over, over sometimes slowly over time. Um, and we have, it's our job here on earth. It's our job as disciples to help, um, to listen, right? To listen for that call, to be open to hearing that call in our life and to do things in our life that help us to discover 
what our primary vocation is. And that right now, that discovering of what your primary vocation is, that living your life now to help inform and help you figure out how God wants you to live your life out in your eventual primary vocation um, is is called, I call it, I called um, a temporary or a secondary vocation. And that's what you're discovering right now. And now a lot of you are going, but like you said, Amanda, you said a vocation is the work in which we're employed. Like I don't have a job again, I'm in middle school or like, like legally I can't work, right? Um, or at least not like at McDonald's or whatever. Um, so you're like, well, I don't have a job. If I don't have a job, I don't even have a secular vocation. If I don't have a secular vocation, how could I have a religious vocation, right? wrong. Um, all of you have temporary or secondary vocations right now, like in this moment, like the beginning round to what can you do tomorrow? Actually, you can start today figuring out um, what you're helping to discern what your primary vocation is by living out and recognizing the temporary or the secondary vocation um, that God has put in your life right now. So what do I mean by that? Um, what I mean by that is like, say, so when I was young, when I was younger, um, in fact, my entire life, my mom will tell stories about the fact that I've always been drawn to children. Like I've always loved babies and little kids and I've always connected with them and just, um, been kind of a natural caretaker. Like that's always been part of, of who I am. It's part of how God made me. Um, and so when I was, um, you know, a teenager and in high school and, and later junior high and stuff, I did a lot of babysitting. Um, I did a lot of babysitting for families around and got very close to some families. And like, that was just a big part of, um, of my life. Now, at the time, I wasn't necessarily thinking, okay, what is this natural caretaking? What is this, you know, desire to, to care for others? Um, what does that have to do with how God's calling me to live out my life? But I did know, and what that experience did teach me, was that I had a call to be a mother. Like I understood that God had put a desire in my heart um, to have children, to be a mother. Um, and that is part of the primary vocation of marriage that I'm currently living out. I have three incredible kids um, who just light up my world every day. And, like, and, and I know in that role of mother that I am living out the call that Jesus um, has put in my heart that God has called me to in this life. Um, and that's a beautiful gift that I got. And I partially discovered that truth through my temporary vocation as a babysitter um, when I was younger. Um, another example might be, um, maybe you really like to, you're in the debate club or you really like to, um, to debate or argue or um, speak, right? Maybe that's something that you feel really called to is, is, um, is speaking or giving presentations or kind of being out there and sharing your thoughts and your ideas with the world in some way, maybe that's writing, whatever. That could be, it could be part of God calling you to be open to the idea of being a preacher, of being a priest maybe, or being a religious sister who does, um, who speaks or does education or a religious brother who, you know, with an order that's focused on education or speaking. Um, it could also be that God's saying like, hey, maybe you have a calling into journalism or um, being a lawyer or something like that because what also happens is that once we discover our primary vocation right our secondary vocation doesn't go away so I'm a wife and a mother that's my primary vocation that's my number one job is to serve God through that vocation but then I'm also a speaker right I have other roles and I've played other roles in my life that are my secondary what might be more my secular vocation but our secular vocations should also serve the kingdom of God, right? We don't have our primary vocation where we're serving God and then our work in which we're employed, our secular where we're just like, meh, that's over here. Let's have a box. We're not worried about that, right? That's not how it works. Everything in our lives needs to be integrated and everything needs to be pointing to heaven. And so in my, in your secular vocation is maybe a lawyer or a doctor or a, um, you know, whatever that might be, a, a nurse a business owner, an accountant, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be, construction worker, you know, um, all of those things, that secular vocation is pointing you towards your primary vocation, is pointing you toward, and, and those together should be pointing you towards heaven. 
And so God could be using your gift of writing or speaking or arguing to help you discover your future secular vocation and how that secular vocation is going to lead you into your primary vocation and also to serve God. So I hope that's not too like, like loopy and all over the place. Um, another, another example, maybe you're an athlete right now. Maybe you play baseball or soccer or swim or whatever. And, and, and maybe you feel like a natural leader, like on your team, people look up to you, um, right? They look up to you. They, uh, they go to you for advice or you're kind of that natural team leader person who kind of keeps everyone moving and motivated and going forward and attitude positive on the team and all those great things. Um, again, that could be God and probably is God giving you those natural gifts and talents to help point you towards where he wants you to be as your, as your primary vocation. Those natural leadership skills, you know, are essential for any religious vocation for sure, right? We know our priests are, um, are the leaders of our parish or the shepherds of our flocks. And so um, having them, um, having them be natural leaders is really important. So maybe God's revealing this leadership skill to you as the first step in, re in, in relieving, uh, revealing a vocational call to the priesthood. Um, maybe it's his way of saying, like, you're going to be a leader in the secular world. And through that leadership position, you're going to have access to people and be able to share God's truth and God's love um, in the secular world through a leadership vocation, right? Certainly fathers and mothers need to be, um, you know, husbands and wives need to be leaders in their family and in their community um, in order to fully live out that vocation of, um, of marriage that God has called them to. Um, and then the other, the last one is kind of a little, a little different that I wanted to just bring up for you guys to think about is like, um, maybe you're that person, I was kind of this person, I'm still this person that people come to when they need to talk, right? If they have something on their mind, they need advice, they just need someone they know is going to listen to them. Um, and so maybe you're that good listener, maybe that's a, a gift and a talent that God has given to you. Um, and he could be calling you to use that again, our religious brothers and sisters, um, you know, counsel, listening is a huge part of that vocation, as it is as a wife and mother, as it is as a consecrated single, as it is in all the vocations. Um, but maybe when you're in, you know, a non-religious thing, he's calling you into something like counseling, um, to be a counselor, or to be a, a therapist of some sort, in order to serve his kingdom by helping his, um, his children with their mental health struggles, which is such a huge thing right now. Um, so all of this is to say that like the roles that you're playing in your world now, your vocation right now as student, as athlete, as um, journalist, as writer, as brother, as sister, you know, as daughter, as son, all those things that are currently your vocation that you're living out right now are all ways that God is going to use to reveal your gifts and talents that he's naturally given you to use to serve his kingdom and to help point you towards where he's calling you um, for your, both your primary vocation and your more permanent secular or secondary vocation um, as an adult living out the faith in the world. Um, and I know that if I was you right now, I'd be going like, that's, that's all well and good, but like, I do a lot of things and there's a lot of parts of me and how do I know which parts God is using to call me in a direction in which parts are, you know, just things that I like to do right now and aren't going to be that big of a deal um, later on. Like, how do I sort all that out, right? Um, we have to be able to listen, right? We have to be able to listen. Just like when your teachers are talking to you and they're trying to teach you something new, right? Math class is trying to teach you a new way uh, to do math or, or um, you know, teach you a new writing style or whatever it might be, a new scientific concept. Like you have to be able to listen to them really intentionally in order to be able to learn, to hear what they want you to know. And that's exactly the same um, with God. So how do we listen to God? How do we discern um, God's call? Because the number one question that I get from kids your age when I do retreats and when I do speaking events and like I get to travel around a bit, um, is how can I know what God wants me to do? Like everyone's always telling me, like God's going to reveal your vocation to you. God has a plan for your life. God's going to 
um, you know, show you where he wants you to be and what he wants you to do. And it's like, okay, but like how? Again, like God's not going to sit down next to me, you know, like right here. That'd be cool. Wouldn't that be cool if just like she disappeared? So, um, but he's not going to just like sit down next to you and be like, okay, here's a list of all the things I want you to accomplish in your life. Here's what I'm calling you to do. Go do it. Like that would be awesome. But that's not how it works, unfortunately. So how can we know what God wants us to do? The answer to that question is both really simple and really hard at the same time. But it, it comes from right here. This is where I, at least I get the root of how do I find out what God wants me to know. And it's by remembering, by reminding myself what he says to us in Jeremiah 29, verses 11, 14, where he says, for I know well the plans I have in mind for you. Oracle of the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your woe, so as to give you a future of hope. When you call me and come to me and pray to me, I will listen to you. When you look for me, you will find me. Yes, when you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me. Right, and so for me, this, this, these verses right here, and I know they're Jeremiah 29 11 is probably one of the most uh, well-known passages in the Bible, right? For I know well the plans I have in mind for you, plans for your welfare, not for your woes, which is give you a future of hope. Um, but what this as a whole is telling me, like, is that God knows what's best for me. God knows what he has planned for me that's going to lead to my ultimate happiness, right? Um, and that's super comforting and super inspiring to me uh, as a Catholic in the world. But the other thing that I know from reading this is it says when you call me and come to me and pray to me I will listen to you when you look for me you will find me when you seek me with all your heart I will let you find me right it doesn't say I'm going to come to you and give you all the answers like you just you just don't have to do anything like I'm going to come I'm going to come to you I'm going to find you I'm going to talk to you I'm going to share everything with you and tell you exactly what I want you to do says, no, 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 there's active, it has to be active on our part, right? We know that God is always calling us into relationship with him, but he needs our response. He wants our response. He desires our response. And so we have to in turn respond to that call, to that tug that we feel in our heart. And we respond to him and say, what are you trying to tell me? Like, what do you want, God? Like, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm open, talk to me. Um, and in order to do that, we have to build a strong and a significant relationship with God, a real relationship with God, right? We have to know him, not just as kind of this idea in our head or this person that we hear talked about um, in Mass on Sundays or we read about in the scriptures, but really to know him on a much more, excuse me, much more intimate and a much more real level. Um, so how do we do that, right? So right now I want you to just take a minute and just think in your head about the people who are most significant um, in your life right now, your best friend, someone you uh, are super close to, maybe it's an aunt, an uncle, a brother, a sister, mom, dad. Um, maybe it's that one friend that you have that you know you can confide in, that you can, um, you can trust, right? So just in your mind, just pull, pull those people to mind. Now I want you to think about how that relationship developed from the time you guys first met to getting to where you are now, right? How did that relationship develop? How did you become close to that person? Now I'm guessing that some of the things that are coming to mind is you're like, oh, well, like we had class together, so we spent time together or we played on the same sports team or in the same band or you know, did the same activity, but we met each other and then we started spending time together. And as we spent time together, we realized we had a lot of things in common and that we really enjoyed being around each other and as we discovered that like then we started to trust each other and like realizing that I could share my thoughts and feelings my worries whatever it might be I could share all of that with um with this person and it would be safe right like they were always going to be there for me I knew that um and we have a lot of fun together and we laugh and we share and I know that this person's gonna gonna be there um, for me when I, you know, when I call them or when I stop by their house or if I just say I need you, like they're going to be there for the good times, they're going to be there for the hard times, right? Um, 
And that's awesome. And like, that's, that's a friend, right? Like that's what a best friend is. That's what a confidant is. That's what somebody who you can trust and who you know loves you unconditionally, right? That's a big thing there, right? Is those true friends, those people who are closest to us, we can show them our best selves and we can show them our worst selves and they're still going to be there. They're still in it, right? They're still there for us. They're not going anywhere. Um, and I want you to think about what would happen if all that stuff we just talked about, if you talked about, if you just stopped doing all those things. If you stopped calling that person or texting them or hanging out with them, if you stopped sharing your life, if you stopped listening to what they had to say, if you stopped taking their advice or seeking it, um, you know, if you let weeks, days or weeks or months or even years go by without putting any effort into that relationship, what would happen to you? Like, would it still be there? Would that friendship still be that relationship still be what it was? And the answer, of course, is no, right? Because the point is that relationships take work, they take effort, and they take commitment on both sides, right? So everything I've just said is true, would be true if your friend did that to you, right? It's still going to damage the relationship. It's still going to um, cause distance between you. It's still going to break trust. Right? Because relationships take commitment, they take effort, um, and they take work from both sides in order for them to be strong and to last. You get out of them what you put into them. And the same is true with God. Um, we get out of our relationship with God what we put into it. And so if we're saying, like, I don't know what God wants in my life, I don't ever really, I don't know if he's there or if he's listening or how to connect with him, the first place to start on that is to examine your own effort, right? To say, how much effort am I putting into getting to know God, to getting to know Jesus, letting him into my life, um, to really sharing who, to really sharing, to really share who I am and what's important to me and what I seek and desire with him. Like, how much am I, how much am I putting into that? Because what we know, the difference between our relationship with God and our relationship with humans is that God never fails us. God, God never leaves us. God never stops, not for one second in our life, stops reaching out to us, stops trying to, to connect with us, stops trying to call us closer to him, right? That's the beautiful thing about it is when we're thinking about this relationship, like that side's solid. He's always there. He's always there for us. And so if there's some, you know, some distance that we're feeling from him, the place to start is to examine our own hearts and our own um, actions in our own effort in that relationship. Um, to be thinking about how much effort am I putting into getting to know God? How much effort am I putting into sharing my life with Jesus? To sharing my heart, my hopes, my fears, to seeking advice from him, and to listening. That's the big one, to listening to what he has to say, right? So again, the question becomes, how do we do that? Because once again, that's not right here chilling at, I mean he is he is right here chilling at my side my arm's like disappearing in my background here guys um, but he's not physically here like my best friend could walk in and sit down next to me right that doesn't happen with God unfortunately um, so how do we how do we listen how do we hear what he's doing um, the number one way the number one way is prayer and I'm sure that's something you guys have heard before and I know when I was growing up uh, something I heard all the time, and I understood that it was true, but I also didn't understand how I was supposed to do it, right? Um, and so I think what happens with prayer is that, again, it's simple, but it's not easy. We all, hopefully, have some form of prayer life, right? Um, we go to Mass on Sunday, which is the highest form of prayer we can do on earth. It's the highest form of worship we can do on earth. Um, you know, maybe our families pray the rosary together every night or once a week or whatever. We pray around the table together at dinner or before bed or um, those sorts of things like that. And those are all beautiful routines of prayer. Um, but what the trap can be sometimes, I've noticed, um, especially with kids your age, is that we get into this mindset, I certainly had it, was that in order to pray, we have to have the right words. We have to say them in the right way. You know, a lot of our gorgeous, gorgeous um, history and litany of prayer in the church um, is kind of formal, right? Like, um, 
if you think of the words of the Our Father, you think of the words of the Hail Mary, two of the ones that most of us could just, you know, recite without even thinking about it. It's not the way we speak right now, right? Um, it's a little more fancy. It's a little more formal. And so I think sometimes we get hung up on how we can pray, how we can, because we think we have to have these floral, flowery, formal, fancy ways to speak to God. Um, but I want you to know right now, I want you to hear this right now, you don't have to have that right? To pray really just means to talk. That's all it is. It's to have a conversation. It's to talk. Um, I think it was in old English. They say like, pray tell, like, pray tell me, sir, what's going on with you today, right? And that just meant like, talk to me. I want to hear what's going on with you. And so we talk about prayer. When we talk about praying, um, we're really just talking about having a conversation with God, um, you know? And a lot of times my conversation with God when I can get out of my own head and remember that I don't need the flowery fancy words or all of that is like, Hey, so, um, today was really hard. Like I got a lot on my plate. I'm feeling super stressed out and my attention span is short or my temper is, you know, my fuse is short and I feel like I'm going to blow up at any moment. I just really need, like, I need some peace and I need some, some help and I need to kind of find a way to manage my stress better. Like, can you help me out with that? Or like, hey, I just had this great day. Like, I'm really excited about what I get to do tomorrow. Um, it's going to be really fun. I have this, you know, my kids have soccer games or baseball games or whatever. And, and, uh, and I'm excited to go cheer them on and be a part of that with them and celebrate it with them. And just, could you, um, you know, could you just watch over them, God, and just like help them not to get hurt and to just have fun uh, in everything that they're doing, um, you know, like, or, I really don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. Like, I don't know, I'm, conf I'm confused about where you want me to go, what you want me to do, God, like, but I'm here and I wanna know, like, I wanna listen to you. And then we have to give him space to talk, right? So we don't have to go to him with fancy words. We do have to go to him with words, but then we also have to remember to have times of no words, which is hard for us, right? Times of silence where we can let him speak to us but then also being open to hearing how he's speaking through other, other means. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. Um, another way that we can know who God is and what he's calling us to in our life is through engaging in the sacraments. Um, the sacraments are so critical and so important to our relationship with God, especially the sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and the sacraments of reconciliation. And, and why I, point, why I point out those two particularly um, is they're the ones that we can engage in weekly, you know, daily if we want to. Um, and they're the two that, that on a regular basis give us that direct access to that fount of grace, right, that's pouring out. Because when we go to Mass, and we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, we actually get to take Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity into ourselves. Like, we become living tabernacles. We get to carry him out with us in the world. And I don't know about you, but like, I can't think of any way to be closer to someone than to actually be carrying them with us in the world, right? I remember when I was pregnant with my babies and feeling them move and, and feeling that life inside of me. You know, it, we, we get that with Jesus, with the Eucharist. We get that life inside of us with the Eucharist every week. Um, and then with the sacrament of reconciliation, because just like our human relationships, we know that if we make mistakes, if we're, um, you know, we have baggage and stuff that we're carrying, things we're not proud of, things we're struggling with, um, holding on to mistakes that we've made, that that just, it makes it hard to be in, in that close relationship. And we know that that's true with sin and our relationship with God. And so going to the sacrament of reconciliation and unburdening ourselves, sharing that with God, um, and letting his grace and his mercy wash over us and relieve us of that burden. There's like no better way to build that relationship, right? And to repair it if maybe it's broken. And so engaging in the sacraments, especially the Eucharist and reconciliation um, will help us to be closer to God. And when we're closer to God, we trust him more. And when we feel, when we feel closer to God, we trust him more. And when we trust him more, we can better hear and understand what he wants for us, right? Where he's trying to lead us because we trust Jeremiah 29, 11. We believe that he has, good, he has nothing but good plans for us. Um, another great way is to spend time studying scripture, reading 
in studying scripture. Um, I like to kind of think of scripture as, as kind of like God's text messages, right? I was saying earlier, like he doesn't text us, but he kind of does. He just did it, you know, a lot of years ago. Um, but reading the scripture and really asking as you go to read it, just saying like, hey, God, I know you have a message for me in this passage I'm supposed to read. Help me hear it. Help me see it. Right. And taking your time to not just read it over once and put the Bible to the side and go on with your day, but really to, to read it over and to, to think about it and to say, you know, like I said, like, God, let help me see the message you have for me here. Um, and letting that be a way that God can speak directly to you. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been wrestling with something or trying to figure something out or uh, whatever. And I will just encounter either in the daily readings or Sunday readings or through opening the Bible, um, a passage that's just like, oh, yeah, okay, yep, mm -hmm. makes sense now. Thanks, God. You know, like, it's just like he sent me a text. It was like, hey, Amanda, here's what's up, you know, and just lays it out for me um, right through his God. Because that, the Bible, we believe the Bible is the living word of God, right? It's not a dead book. It's not just words on a page. It's actually the living word of God. It's how he, it's one of the ways he speaks and communicates with his, um, with his beloved. So do that. Um, and then surrounding yourself with people who are going to lead you closer to God, because God will use those people to reveal, he'll use those human relationships to reveal his wants and desires for your life, um, to point you in the direction you're supposed to go. So it's really important to surround yourself with friends um, and with people who are going to support you on that journey and are going to help you hear to God's call in your life and not run from it or be led away from it. Um, so it's like, great, so now I have all these tools, right? I can pray, I can read the Bible, I can do the sacraments, I can surround myself with good people, but how is this all going to help me discover my vocation, Amanda? How is this going to go more than just building a relationship with God to actually discovering my vocation? And so the truth is that like on its own, it won't. It won't. On its own, it won't. <laughs> you just take these pieces and don't actually engage in them um, and don't ask God, you know, what he wants you to do with them. On its own, it won't because we only get answers to the questions that we ask, right? And sometimes we have to ask those questions over and over and over again, because it can be hard to know when we feel something inside of us, like a desire to do something. It's hard to know, is that desire coming from God, right? Is that a holy desire? Or is it coming from me? Is it my own ego, my own wants, or my own desires that are leading me in that direction? Um, or is it coming from the devil? Is it his, he, is he trying to put that desire in our heart to actually lead us away from where God's calling us? And so we have to be persistent. We have to ask over and over again um, in prayer with a sincere heart, God, what do you want from me? And just a quick, I know we're, I want to make sure we save time for some of these questions that I see popping up. Um, and so I just wanted to, to kind of close and share um, the story of how this Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. Like this is, um, this is another verse that, that kind of roots me in my own discernment in my life about things because it's not saying I don't have to do anything, right? It's not saying the Lord will fight for you. You have only, you have only to just sit there and do nothing. It's saying you have only to keep still, right? In other words, I don't have to run around chasing God. I don't have to run around on my own power and my own strength and my own everything trying to figure out what he wants for my life, right? All I have to do is be still and know that he is God. All I have to do is be still and engage in prayer with him. All I have to do is trust that where I am is where he wants me to be as long as I'm inviting him into that conversation, right? And so one example of this, um, of how this has kind of lived out in my life is that um, I mentioned I've been in youth ministry for like 15 years. It's probably closer to 20 now, um, including my time in this ministry. Um, but prior to that, I was actually a uh, physical therapist, a pediatric physical therapist. I worked at Children's Hospital in Seattle with kids who had had been in accidents or had major illnesses or surgeries or things like that, um, spinal cord injuries, brain injuries, all that kind of stuff. And I helped them get to, to go home again. It was an amazing job, just an incredible, incredible job. Um, and so during the time I was doing that job, I was getting more involved at my parish with the youth ministry program. And through that, I started feeling like maybe God wanted me to do this youth ministry thing full time. Um, but I didn't know. I didn't know. Is it like I enjoy the kids? I enjoy 
you know, the people I'm with, I enjoy all this kind of stuff. And so that's why I want to do it. It's out of me, right? Um, I know I'm doing good work at my job and maybe I'm supposed to do that. And maybe God has more for me to do there. And so the devil is saying, mm, you're going to go this way, even though youth ministry would be, it seems like, right? That seems like it would be a holy call. Devil can twist things. So is that like the devil saying, I'm going to pull you out of this world that you're in where you're doing good and you're touching people and you're, you're revealing God's truth to them. And kind of make you think this other thing is what God wants you to do. And you're going to be less impactful there, right? You're going to have less of an effect there. Ha ha ha, tricky devil. Um, so is it that, or was it actually a holy call of God? And so I spent several years, actually, it was probably close to three years, praying and discerning, is this what you want to me, God? Where are you calling me to serve you? How do you want me to use these gifts and talents and desires that you've given me? How do you want me to use those um, here on earth to serve you? And I had to ask that question over and over and over again, right? I had to be patient because the call didn't, the answer didn't come right away. I had to be persistent. I kept asking over and over again. I had to be open that maybe what I wanted, what I thought I really wanted, what I thought I was being called to maybe wasn't what I was being called to, right? I had to be humble enough to ask that question and to say, I don't know the answer. Like I can't figure this one out on my own. I need your help. I need your guidance, right? And then the most important, I had to be ready and willing to respond. So there came a day in this discernment, um, and I was real sure that God wanted me in youth ministry. He had confirmed that in my heart, but I didn't know where. I didn't know where he wanted me. And a job opening had come, and I had applied for it, and just kind of had some unrest, some unease in my heart. You guys have probably felt that before, and you're trying to make a decision. And so I was sitting in prayer and I just kept running to my mind. I was like, okay, so God, if I do this, like I can do this. I know I can do this. I can take this path. I can go this way and I can do these things. Like, is that where you want me to be? And I would just kind of sit there in silence and in prayer for a little while. And then I'd say, you know, the other option, or I could do this. Like, is this where you want me to be? Is this how you want me to use it? And then I would sit there in prayer for a while. And I did this over and over again over the course of a couple of days. And slowly what started to happen in my heart, because this is the way God speaks to me, is that as I presented one option, I would see that I totally was capable of doing that. I could do that. Like I could be that, right? But there was no peace around it. I still felt kind of <clears throat> yucky about it or, or just uneased, unsettled about it. And so then I would go, okay, well, here's this other option. And I'd you know, kind of say, I could totally do that. Like, I can totally be this. But when I said that, and I thought about that path, about that choice, I got this sense of peace and of calm that came with it. And at some point, it clicked in my brain, and I was like, wait a minute. God has, nothing, God has nothing but good things planned for me. He wants me to have a life of joy and of peace and not of stress and of strife. So if this option is causing stress, causing me to feel, oh, not good about it. And this option is bringing me peace. Like this is where I'm called. And that's what eventually led me to the youth ministry position I held forever um, and down the road in the continued discernment process to be in here with you guys today. And I couldn't be happier. I haven't regretted those choices once. In fact, the only choices in my life I've regretted are the ones I haven't involved God in. And so just in closing, be patient, be persistent, be open, be humble, be ready to, and willing to respond. Um, to God and know that his peace is there for you. Know that he wants nothing but good for you. Um, and know that if you ask and you seek him, he is going to lead you to your vocation. And he's leading it to you, you to it right now through all the things that you enjoy, all the things that he calls you to do right now. But we have to be willing to engage in that conversation, right? We have to be willing to build that relationship so that we really can hear, um, hear him however he speaks to you. Um, and be able to seek and to know his will for our lives, both right now as a middle schooler and as you continue to grow. So we've got about, I think about 15 minutes left um, for some questions. Um, I see that the Q&A has like 15 of them up there. So I'm just gonna open this up and- uh, I'm gonna and... throw you a couple from the okay, chat wanna... also, Amanda. Okay, um... do you wanna do that? And I'll answer those instead of the ones in the- yeah, yeah, the Q&A. If you guys have some more, go ahead and put them in there. Some of those are just comments, though, also. 
Okay. Um, so some that are specific to you. So if we don't get to all of them, you guys can go to your discussion room and still ask some of these questions. Specific for you though, Amanda, is one person wants to know how old you were when you got married and how old your kids are. Oh, okay. Um, I was, or you can ask me how old I was. I was 25 when I got married. Um, and I have a 17 year old daughter who's a senior in high school and going off to college. Uh, um, and I have a 13 year old son and an eight year old son. So kind of all the way down the line, we've got senior in high school, all the way to second grader getting his, his first communion here in a, in a couple months. So yeah, thanks for asking. Thank you. The next question is, can you have several vocations in your life? And you kind of touched on this, but if they didn't yeah. hear you. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely. So you have, you have one primary vocation that you're called to, right? That it's our job to discover. And that's what all these other temporary and secondary vocations um, help you to discover. So like I was saying, when I was younger, some of my vocations was athlete, um, was student, was journalist, was babysitter, was sister, was daughter, um, friend, those sorts of things. I worked at a, you know, I was, I was in high school, I had a job. Um, I worked at a, at a um, called Discovery Zone. They're not around anymore, but it was like a play place, kind of like a Chuck E. Cheese type place. Um, so I had that vocation as well. And all of those temporary vocations that I had helped to reveal to me where God was calling me in my primary vocation as an adult. So you absolutely will have uh, multiple primary vocations. And some people, I mean, multiple secondary or temporary vocations. And some people, you know, look at like the singlehood as a kind of transitional vocation for some people, right? So you're single right now. You might be single into your young adult life. And that can be um, be a vocation for you in that moment, right? It's a time and space in your life that you have the freedom um, to give to the church in a very unique way because you're not living at a primary vocation with another person yet, if that makes sense. So yes, the, the long answer to a short question is yes, you can have many vocations um, throughout your life, but ultimately you have one primary vocation that God is trying to reveal to you and calling to you that's gonna be your, um, your best way to live out, um, live out your life as a disciple. The next one, some clarification. So it's how can you be patient, but also persistent in asking mm -hmm. God to help you discern your vocation? Yeah, so that's great. That's a great question. Um, the way that you're both patient and persistent is that persistence is not impatient, right? Persistence is the willingness not to give up. Um, and so we're persistent in asking the question and patient in listening for the response. So if I were to ask the question only once of God, what do you want, how do you want me to serve you? Like youth ministry or physical therapy, like how do you want me to serve me? I just asked it once. Then figuring it out would have been me relying on my own intellect, on my own ego, on my own wants, thoughts, feelings, and desires to figure that out, right? But in being persistent and asking that question to God, not angry, not aggressive, but just like, all right, I'm still trying to figure it out, God. I'm coming to you again. I still need guidance. Like being persistent in asking that question and being patient for him to, um, to respond for me, to actually being patient for me to understand and discern his response. Awesome. Another one is, can your secular vocation change with your religious or primary vocation and vice versa? Uh, so can your secular vocation change with your religious vocation? Absolutely. My secular vocation has changed many times since I was married, right? But my primary vocation remains marriage, remains wife and mother, right? But like I said, I've been a, a you know, a physical therapist, I've been a youth minister, I've been a speaker, I, you know, I'm a woodworker, I, I have a lot of other secular vocations that I've been engaged in and employed in, event planning, all kinds of stuff, um, but that, but they're all, you know, a step below in my life priority list, in my faith priority list, than my primary vocation is wife and mother, um, your primary vocation, if properly discerned, doesn't change, right? If properly discerned. And that means that if you have, 
have relied on God and you trust in him and you feel very confident in that decision, you've probably made the right one. Like, I don't question my primary vocation as wife and mother. Um, my priest doesn't question his primary vocation as, as a priest, right? I have an aunt who's been a sister of St. Joseph of Condolette for 30 something years now, right? And she knows that that is the right primary vocation for her um, to serve. And now I do know people, I have, we, I have heard stories of priests who were married and then widowed. So they weren't, they were primary vocation marriage, right? And then their wife passed away and they felt a call into the priesthood. So there are rare occasions when your primary vocation can change. Um, but for the most part, you have one primary vocation that God has um, wants you to engage in, wants you to be a part of in your life. Okay, I have two more here. So the first one is, have your talks taken you out of the country? And if they have, can you share some of them? So if you, even not out of the country, one of maybe your favorite, favorite locations for a talk. Oh my goodness. Um, am I required to say Mrs. Buchanan's old parish was one of my favorite places for a talk? <laughs> um, but no, I, unfortunately my, my speaking hasn't taken me physically out of the country um, yet but I hope for, I love traveling. So I would love for it to take me out of the country. I would love to go somewhere. Um, that would be amazing. Um, favorite places to talk. That's so hard. <laughs> I did do a, a youth conference um, over in Eastern Washington a couple of years ago and one in Idaho that were both really, the Idaho one was really fun. I got to work with um, a Christian uh, magician called Dan, named Danny Ray. And if you guys have ever, I haven't heard of him, you might want to YouTube him or, or check him out. Um, he's fantastic. He's an incredible magician who uh, is very, you know, very transparent and says, this is magic. This is illusion. Like, this is illusion. This is not magic. Like, this is not, um, this is not real. I am tricking you. Like, he will tell you that right off the bat. But then uses um, his magic tricks to relay the truth of God which is really cool. So that was a really fun one to get to work with him. Okay, final question. And then we're going to get wrapped up, guys, and get ready to head into discussion groups again. Um, the final question is, at the end of Exodus 14.14, 14, it says, keep still. How can we follow all the bullet points on the PowerPoint while keeping still? as the verse yeah. says. Yeah, so I talked a little bit about that, but I'll kind of I'll circle back around because I know I said a lot. Um, the Lord will fight for you. You have only to keep still. Doesn't mean you are inactive, right? It means that you are not chasing answers on your own. The Lord is doing the battle for you. He's doing the work for you. Um, he knows the plans, Jeremiah 29, 11. He knows what he wants for you. And he's asking you to come to him and let him reveal it to you. So being patient, being persistent, being open, being humble, being willing to respond, you can do all of those. In fact, some of those you have to do in the stillness of prayer, right? But if I'm spending my whole life running around and trying to, to chase down answers on my own, whether it's actually physically out there doing that in the world, like running around from place to place, jumping from job to job, from relationship to relationship or vocation to vocation or whatever it is, um, I'm not allowing myself the space to hear what God wants or to discover what God wants for me, right? And so in, if I am still in the sense that I am patient and persistent, open and humble and willing to respond um, and allowing God to speak to me, allowing him to, um, to reveal to me what he wants, um, then in that way, I am being still in my relationship with him. I don't physically have to like stay in one place all the time, right? But I can be still in my relationship with him. I'm not jumping in and out of it. I'm not chasing other relationships to replace that one. I'm, I'm staying rooted in that relationship in order to um, allow him to hear me. And the ways that you can, some of the ways that you can stay still, you can stay rooted in that relationship and open to what he has to say are those bullet points on the other side. Hope that helps. Wonderful. Thank you, Amanda. 
couple end notes and then Amanda is going to end us in prayer. Mm -hmm. We are headed to discussion rooms after this. You will be able to hit the join, the blue join button. We will be in discussion rooms till 1115 uh, Pacific time. For you East Coasters, you're going to have to convert that time over three hours. <laughs> but we're going to head in after discussion room. We're going to have our lunch break for 45 minutes. You guys can get up, stretch, go outside, get some fresh air, and then we'll come back for the second half of the day. Thank you so much, Amanda, for coming today. I'm so excited that you were able to be here. I'm sure that you guys will be taking lots of questions into discussion rooms with you. We will end in prayer. Yeah, thank you guys all for being here, uh, for asking so many questions. I love seeing that there's, you know, those questions popping up through my talk and, and just for being present throughout this. And I just, um, yeah, just gonna close in a little bit of prayer. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together, Lord. We thank you for um, your desires for our lives, Lord, for your gift of vocation, both primary and secular and, and secondary and all those ones we discussed today, Lord. Um, and I really just, my prayer today is just that you are with this group of young people, um, that you can be present with them, help them to see you acting in their life, help them to discern where you're calling them, Help them to be both patient and persistent, to be open and humble, and to be ready and willing to respond to your call in their life so that they can um, discover the ways, the unique and beautiful um, ways that you're calling them to bring your kingdom here on earth. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. And I am uh, more than happy to... Uh, you know, to respond via email to any questions that you guys still have that didn't get answered here today and you don't get answered in small group. Um, Ms. Buchanan has my uh, email address and, and you're welcome to make that available to um, to everyone who is here today. Absolutely. We'll be able to share that in small groups then with um, our upcoming groups with Excellent. that yeah. so they can reach out to you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Awesome, Amanda. We'll talk to you later. Have a wonderful day. All right. Bye. God bless you all. All right. Bye. Bye.